All right, we're ready with the video? Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. So welcome back everybody to EE240. So it uh, looks like the rain is maybe scaring off a few people, but hopefully they'll be trickling in as we go along here. So just a reminder, phase three is out and you guys should all be starting and working on that. Um, I did push the due date back by sort of a couple of days, but really you gotta get going because it's a fairly substantial project. It's a lot of things for you to sort of put together. So it just takes time really to kind of go through it all and make sure you understand what's going on. So actually on that note, how many of you guys here have started phase three already? Couple of people. All right, well, so everybody else, as I said, you know, really get going because it'll sneak up on you very quickly and there's actually quite a bit of stuff you have to do to really make sure you understand what's going on there. So really the big changes are now, basically you have to build the whole link, including the comparator. Uh, actually you have to include the real offsets. So I'm not just gonna tell you that the offset is blah, but you have to figure out what the offset really is based on your own design. So that means you have to go in and add all the basically voltage offsets like we had talked about last time to actually include those effects. Not only that, unfortunately, I'm actually gonna be turning on supply noise because guess what? The world is real and there's junk going on in the supply and you have to deal with it. So I've actually given you some basically circuits that will model the effect of basically variations on the power supply. So you're gonna have to include those as well. So as I said, really you kinda gotta get going just to kind of get a handle on how all these different pieces kind of interact with each other and what's really gonna be the best methodology for you to use to converge to the overall lowest power solution. Uh, the other big change, by the way, is there's no more like you have to run exactly at three gig. It's really sort of up to you to figure out what data rate you want to be running at. So kind of what this means is you get a chance to sort of explore the, let's say, power versus performance space. Now, you'll see that because of the channel I gave you, you're probably not gonna be able to run at, let's say, 20 gigabits or something like that. In fact, even your circuits probably wouldn't want to run that fast. But certainly there's a pretty reasonable range of anywhere from about, let's say, three, maybe even up to about five, or maybe even six if you really push gigabits per second, that you can kind of play around with and see how that would change the amount of power you'd be dissipating. Uh, so for those of you who have sort of taken projects from me before, there's the standard question that comes up of, you know, is it better to be at higher speed or lower power or what? Uh, the answer is I don't care. Uh, all I care is that for whatever speed you're running at, you're dissipating the lowest power you can be. So in other words, if I have a plot of, let's say, power versus data rate, right? Things should look something like, let's say, this. So if you're anywhere on one of these, you know, points here, no problem. I'm happy with that. Meaning any one of those points that's sort of the best you can possibly do. If you're like out over here or out over there, that's bad news, okay? So your goal is to really sort of land on somewhere along this curve over here. And obviously in order to do that, that means that you need to apply a lot of the sort of material that we've been talking about so far to try and understand what's a methodology you can use to make sure you really do land on one of these points right here. So any kind of questions on either the project and the material that we've been talking so, about so far? You guys are all ready to go. Okay, so as I said, make sure you really get going on that very, very soon because it's going to take you some time. Uh, also, just to, again, as another reminder, make sure you've got a partner because you, really, you really don't want to do this by yourself. It's large enough that it'll be just too painful. So make sure you've got a partner. If you can't find a partner for some reason, come and bug me and I'll figure out sort of somebody to, to team you up with. Okay, so unless there's any other sort of questions on this, uh, what I'll do is I just wanted to sort of finish up what we were talking about last time, which was essentially matching. And the last piece that we really didn't get a chance to talk about too much was just sort of a little bit about how you do layout to make sure that you don't have any deterministic matching errors. And then really most of the today we'll spend talking about how would you actually go about building circuits that will cancel the offsets that we're gonna get because of all these matching errors that we've talked about previously. So with that, let's sort of go ahead and dive back in. Um, and as I mentioned, the last thing I sort of wanna just briefly cover in terms of matching was just what does that really mean from the standpoint of layout? So in all the stuff we talked about last time, we were really talking about the random components of the matching, meaning stuff that you really sort of have no control over it. All you can do is sort of build your device and maybe you can do some sizing to change the standard deviation, but basically there's sort of these intrinsic mechanisms that will cause mismatch. On the other hand, as we'd said, we really wanna make sure that we don't have any deterministic errors, meaning things that we could have predicted that they would have caused mismatch. Now, the trick there is that, unfortunately, 
just about everything you can think of can possibly cause mismatch errors. Even things as subtle as like, you have a transistor, and then all the way on the top metal layer, there's a, there's a piece of metal running over that transistor. There's another transistor next to it that doesn't have that piece of metal running on top of it. Guess what? There may be a systematic matching error. Okay? In that particular example, because it just so happens that there's some dangling hydrogen bonds that are more likely to be passivated in one case versus the other. You know, don't ask me the physics, I don't even know, but bottom line, just about anything you can possibly you know, come up with could potentially cause you to have some deterministic mismatch. So, given that that's the case, what do you guys think is like the number one rule to make sure that you don't have any mismatch errors at all? And by the way, I had mentioned this you know, way, way back in the beginning of the semester. <coughs> What's the number one rule you have to follow? Symmetry. Okay, symmetry, what, I mean, you're right, symmetry I'd almost claim is sort of like a subset of what I'm, what I'm getting at. Everything must be the same. Yeah, okay, so when we say the same, I really mean exactly the same, right? So the exact <coughs> is the key word there. Because if it's ever so slightly different, it'll cause a mismatch error. So again, you know, piece of metal on top of it, piece of poly next to it, uh, piece of poly actually on top of it. So let's say this is, let's say these are my two transistors that I want to match to each other. No, if you put a via right there versus you put a via right there on this guy, they'll be different, okay? Or you put a little, I don't know, piece of metal three over there and a piece of metal three over there, again, they'll be different, okay? So the key is really make things as exactly the same as you possibly can. Now, at some point, obviously, because the, you know, one output is plus and one output is minus, you may not exactly be able to make them really, really exactly the same. But the trick there is, you know, to the extent that you can, make sure everything is really as close to exactly the same as you possibly can, okay? Especially things that are sort of nearby the transistor, right? Obviously, if you have something that's like on the other corner of the chip that's a little bit different, well, okay, sorry, not much you can do about that, but that probably won't cause too big of an error anyways, right? So again, the key is really make things as exactly the same as you possibly can for the two devices that you're trying to match. Uh, by the way, in case you haven't seen it before, there's this good book by uh, Hastings. It's called The Art of Analog Layout. It's got a lot of really nice tricks in it to how you can go about actually doing these layouts to make sure that they will not cause basically systematic errors. Okay, so if you're you know, about to tape out a chip or something like that, you've never done any analog layout before, this is definitely a very good reference to take a look at because it's got a lot of just, a lot of these things you can imagine people learn by experience. Right, they do something, they tape the chip out, they get it back. Doesn't quite work, very painful, but at least if you learn something from it, you shouldn't repeat the same mistake. Okay? So definitely take a look at the book. It's got sort of a lot of interesting information there. There was one sort of specific type of layout technique that I want to just briefly talk about, which is a so-called common centroid layout. This is kind of like the classic so-called analog layout trick that most everybody either has heard about or learns about at some point. So this trick here really has to do with canceling linear gradients, okay? Um, and in fact, actually, it's, if you remember I had talked about earlier how in all of those mismatch things there was that term that was proportional to distance. And I said that, you know, okay, we're going to pretend that that distance is really zero. This common centroid is kind of like a trick for how you really make it be quote-unquote zero. So let's just see sort of what I mean by that. So let's say I have two structures. Let's just call them A and B that I want to build that will be matched to each other, okay? So if I want to match these two to each other, as we said sort of before, what I'm probably going to have to do is build these things out of unit cells, right? So let's just draw sort of, let's imagine that each one of them was built out of two unit cells, just as an example. So let's just redraw that quickly. So let's say this is A, this is A, let's say this is B, and this is B, okay? So now, obviously, as you can kind of see here, these two devices are not exactly, the distance between them is not zero, right? There's some sort of finite distance. Now, when I talk about distance, I usually have to sort of define what do I mean by kind of the, the distance, meaning how do I sort of define what are the points at which I measure one device versus the other device? So typically, the way you do that is you'd say something like, well, okay, the distance should really be sort of from the center points of the two devices. Right? That's sometimes also known as the centroid of the two devices. 
All right, so just an example here, I would say the distance from A to B would be from that center line over here to this center line over there, All right? Just as an example. Okay, so now there's kind of a couple of things, right? So one is obviously the distance is not zero. The other is if from whatever reason there's some linear gradient in the process, meaning that from whatever reason things over here, let's say have thicker oxide than things over there, obviously that's gonna cause some asymmetry here. Right? It's gonna cause some mismatch because obviously on this side, the B devices are gonna have slightly thicker oxide than the A devices, okay? So the way to basically fix both of these problems is to try and make it so that the center point of both of these devices is exactly the same, okay? Meaning it's in exactly the same spot. So the way you can do that is kind of obvious, you know, once you see it, but essentially what you do is, if these are kind of like my center dividing lines, then what I wanna do is I wanna arrange the A and B devices symmetrically around those lines. So let me just draw an example of how you might do that. So an example, I might do something like, put the two A's across like this, and the two B's like this, right? Because now basically if I look for the center point of the B, that's right in this spot right there, center point of the A, also right in that spot right there, okay? Now, I drew this with only sort of two unit elements per thing, but you can imagine if you had more unit elements, you just keep sort of following the same rule, right? So you'd essentially find what's the center point of each one of the overall structures, and make sure that that center point is the same for everybody, okay? Now, it turns out that these days, doing exactly this is not necessarily super critical because most of the stuff you're probably dealing with is relatively small. And because it's small enough, if there was any linear gradient there, like nothing would have worked anyways. So, you know, for sort of, let's say moderate matching, let's say up to about 10 or 11 bits, you might not even necessarily need to do this. But if you start going beyond that, if you start having really, really big arrays, you know, a few hundred microns on a side, this becomes really, really critical. Because at that point, you know, any tiny little gradient can cause actually very, very large systematic errors, okay? By the way, how many of you guys have sort of either seen or heard of common centroid layout before? Okay, good, anybody actually done common centroid layout? One person, okay, well, so by the way, I've almost, you know, there, I can count probably on one hand the number of times I've had to do it, but it's useful to know about because again, you know, there's gonna be a case where you're gonna get into these really, really high precision kinds of things. And you're gonna need to know that this is kind of the style of layout you need to be doing. Any questions on this, sir? Okay, so if there's no questions on this, let's actually go ahead and move forward. So as I mentioned previously, the next thing we're really gonna spend some time talking about now is, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about where is this offset coming from? How can we kind of model it? What, how can we predict what the offsets are gonna be from a statistical standpoint? Uh, but obviously as a circuit designer, you're probably even more interested in just how do we get rid of that darn offset, right? So what I'm gonna do today is spend some time talking about what are kind of the main approaches available to us to actually cancel these kinds of offsets. And really what are the sort of issues you run into when you try and do that? So in terms of canceling offset, there's really sort of two main ideas or approaches from a very, very high level. The first is to somehow modulate or filter the offset so that it's kind of like sitting in a different frequency band than the signal that you're interested in, okay? The other is to basically just somehow figure out how do I inject a DC signal that just opposes or cancels that offset. Okay. Now, both of these are used actually fairly often in slightly different applications, and we'll see sort of where it is that they come from. But probably you've, you've probably actually heard of some of these techniques before. This so is an example for this thing here where we're talking about modulating or filtering the offset. The basic idea is if I have some signal and I know it's, let's say, sitting down at, I don't know, 100 megahertz or at a few kilohertz or whatever it is, somehow what I want to try and do is make it so that my offset shows up not at that frequency band. So what I'm somehow gonna be doing is sort of like modifying my circuit so that the offset shows up in a different spot than the actual signal I'm interested in, okay? So there's a couple of examples of how you might do that. 
The first is this so-called CDS. That just stands for correlated double sampling. Okay, it's, I'll explain sort of where it comes from, but really it just means usually the way this something like this works is you sample the offset, and then in the next phase you basically subtract that offset off, or you look at like changes in the signal, and you arrange your circuit in a way that the offset will be the same in both phases, but the signal will actually change. Okay, so that's one version. This is also known as auto zeroing, by the way. The other is the so-called chopping. This is much more literally, you basically take the signal and basically shove it into a different frequency band and then shove it back, but the offset gets treated differently. Uh, again, sometimes you'll hear of this as so-called synchronous detection or in a slightly different context, dynamic element matching. But they're all sort of the same idea of just somehow treat the offset and the signal a little bit differently, okay? This other sort of big category is going to turn out what you're probably going to be doing mostly in your project for this semester. Because as you can kind of imagine, this one's a little bit easier, right? If I can just come up with some DC signal that I can inject to get rid of the offset, then I kind of don't have to worry about like moving things around into different frequency bands and stuff like that. So this is also known, of course, as like trimming. And in particular for, for us, it's kind of nice because as we'll see a little bit later, it's often sort of fairly easy to come up with digital ways of controlling that offset that you inject. Meaning you can come up with sort of very simple loops that just have digital controls in them that set what the value of the offset should be to actually cancel everything out, okay? So let's just first sort of focus on this first big category of basically either filtering or modulating the offset. So we already sort of spent some time talking about what the general idea is. So what we're going to do now is sort of take a look at two specific uh, examples, okay? The first is the so-called correlated double sampling. Uh, again, it's also known as auto-zeroing. And the idea here is that you're basically going to insert some extra clock phases into the amplifier so that in one phase, you're essentially going to measure what the offset is, and in the second phase, you're going to subtract it out, okay? So the idea here is that when you do that, what you're kind of doing is differentiating the offset, right? Because if the offset is really static, then when you take the derivative of that offset, it should be that it goes to zero, right? There should be no residual effect there. Of course, the key is that when you take the derivative of the offset, you don't want to be taking the derivative of the signal because that's probably not the signal you're interested in. So we're going to configure the circuit in a way that the signal doesn't get, you know, basically doesn't have the derivative taken of it, but the offset does, okay? The other big idea that we'll sort of cover briefly at the end is, again, this so-called chopping idea where you literally just take the input signal, modulate it up to a certain frequency, and then demodulate it again at another frequency. And by doing that, you make the offset basically show up at a different frequency, and we can knock it off. But we'll see how we do that in a little bit. So let's first sort of start out with this so-called correlated double sampling. And we'll start out with kind of the simplest possible version of this. This is a so-called output offset cancellation. So the way this thing works is actually fairly straightforward, okay? So what I'm doing here is let's say that this is the amplifier whose offset I want to cancel, okay? So what I've done is I've introduced these two switches right here. So let's just sort of walk through what happens in the two different phases. So in the first clock phase, the way I'm going to configure this thing looks like this. So I'm just going to ground the positive input. The negative input, I'm just going to model that as all of the offset is sitting there on the negative input. Okay. By the way, it doesn't matter which input I put it on. It's kind of the same thing. Just for convenience, I always put it on that negative input there. Okay. At the output, what I'm going to do is that switch over there. Actually, I'll just draw it. I'm going to tie this thing to ground right here. Okay. So this is like my V out that I'm going to be looking at, okay? So it's actually sort of written on the slide here, but I guess it should be obvious. What does this output right here go to relative to ground in this phase if everything settles out? What sort of voltage should be sitting right there directly at the output of the op amp? The amplified <coughs> Yeah, it's just minus A times V offset, right? Which is, of course, exactly what's written here. Okay, so that means that I should everything should start out, or rather, the voltage across that capacitor 
should be minus a times v offset, right? OK, so now in the second phase, what do I do? And I'll draw that maybe over here. In the second phase, all I actually do is open up a bunch of switches and connect the input. So I'm going to have v in connected right here, plus, minus. I still have the offset, but now that's going to be my v out. Okay. So what's sort of nice or interesting about this? Well, in that first phase, because this started out at minus a times vos, right? When I turn off the switch that connects me to ground over here, initially nothing should really change across that cap, right? In other words, I should still be storing that same minus a times vos across there. So it's almost like this capacitor is doing like a voltage level shift, right? It's almost like a battery in series with my output, right? So that means that if I look at this spot right here, now that I add V into it, what I'm going to get is A times V in minus VOS, right? That's kind of like my input signal in here, and then multiplied by A, minus whatever the voltage across the capacitor was, right? Well, that voltage across the capacitor, that was just storing minus A times VOS, right? So in other words, if I looked at this output right here, because I already stored what the offset was, that output will now not have any offset in it, right? It should change only due to the input, right? Well, nice, right? I have no residual offset, right? I completely got rid of it just by sort of storing it across this capacitor right here. Now, it turns out this actually works pretty nicely, at least in some contexts. In particular, because one thing you have to sort of always keep in mind that we'll actually talk some more about probably next time. Anytime I draw these switches here, and in fact, we talked about this a long time ago when we talked about switch cap amplifiers. Anytime I draw these switches, when you turn them off, unfortunately, things don't exactly go the way you want them to. There's always some sort of glitches that get introduced when you turn those things off. Okay? The thing that's really good about this particular topology is even if there's some glitches from turning that switch off, those glitches show up at the output. That means that their effect is basically attenuated by the gain of the amplifier. Right? In other words, if there was some glitch that caused, let's say, a 1 millivolt error, in terms of its effect on the input, that gets attenuated by whatever the gain actually is. Okay? So that's, that's good news. Unfortunately, there's one thing that's kind of very bad news about this particular topology. Okay? So to see that, let's actually just walk through a very simple example. So let's say that I tell you that my offset is 10 millivolts and my gain is 100. Okay? So in that first phase, what voltage is going to show up directly at the output of the amplifier? How much sort of offset voltage am I storing? A volt. Yeah, I'm storing a volt, right? Okay, so now let's say I told you the power supply here was, I'll even be nice, 1.2 volts. What's the problem? Headroom problem? Yeah, right? If I'm storing a negative 1 volt offset, I can basically only put in like 2 millivolts of input signal before my output just completely hits the rail, right? In other words, because I'm storing this offset directly at the output right here, whatever that offset is, or really whatever that amplified offset is, it's going to eat into my signal swing, right? Because the only signal swing I have left is the difference between this and however much, you know, however close I can actually get to the supply rails, right? So in particular, if you're dealing with like small devices or high gain, that's pretty bad news. Because that basically means that most of your signal range is just going to be completely eaten up by this amplified residual offset. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? Okay, so now, what applications do you think it's kind of okay to do this? One, would it be sort of not so bad that this thing gets moved by potentially a large amount? Where might it be okay? In a two Okay, can you be more specific? Oh, um, I'm not sure why the slow comes into the picture. 
let's talk about maybe like in your link. Preamp. Okay, so how much gain did you have in your preamp? Two or three or something like that. Two or three, okay, yes. right. And in the preamp, usually you weren't sort of like too limited by headroom, right? Probably you had enough, more than enough swing if you really needed it. So maybe it was kind of okay to get rid of 100 millivolts or so of that swing because you could still get enough extra swing around it to make sure that everything worked, right? So the key is really you have to be sort of not very limited by swing. Now, as we talked about, oftentimes you are unfortunately very limited by swing, particularly if you're very noise limited, right? So that's kind of this trade-off of doing this output offset cancellation here. Now, the good news is, of course, there's other things you can do, right? So there's other ways of essentially storing that offset onto a capacitor somewhere and then coupling the signal in in a way that it does not get canceled. So the other version is really the so-called input offset cancellation. So I'm just going to draw sort of the full circuit with all the switches and everything, and then we'll walk through and see how the thing works. So I'm going to have something like this, and this is going to be phase one. That's going to be phase two. I'm going to have a capacitor here like this. And I'm going to have my amplifier. And again, I'm just going to model all of the offset as being on that positive terminal over there. And we have another switch right here, which is going to be on during phase one. And I'm going to take the output from right there. Okay. So again, let's just sort of walk through how this thing works in the different phases. So during phase one, essentially what I have is something that looks like the following. So all those switches that are connected to phase one, all of those are going to be on. So my circuit is essentially going to look something like that. Okay. Oops. Okay, so during that phase, what is V out going to be? Relative to ground, of course. What's V out going to be in that phase? V offset. Yeah, this thing just looks like a unity gain buffer, right? Nothing magic there. That's just a unity gain buffer. So V out is just going to be the offset, right? Okay, so that means that this voltage here across the capacitor, and notice how I put the positive and minus, that's going to be minus V offset, right? Okay, so now in phase two, all I'm going to do is I connect V in, I go through that capacitor, I go into the amplifier, I come out, and then of course I still just have my offset right here. Okay? So, if I look at this voltage right there where I just put the dot right there, what's that going to be? Once I've connected myself to V in over here, what's that going to be? And plus v offset. Ah, is it plus V offset? Oh, sorry, you're right. No, yeah, you guys are right. Sorry, that's right. Yes. It's V in plus V offset, right? Which means, of course, if I look at the effective input, it's going to be V offset minus V in plus V offset, right? That's the differential input, okay? Which, of course, is just V in, right? So now the output should, of course, just be A times V in. Again, no offset, right? So now, looks like it works. Looks like also, notice, all I had to do was store the offset across this cap, right? not the amplified offset. So since I'm only storing this offset and I'm doing it directly at the input, I'm not really eating into my signal swing, right? Because at the output, I should just get exactly the amplified version of my input signal, OK? So that sounds pretty good. But there are a couple of things that are not so good about this particular design, or not, I should say, as good as the previous version. So what are some of the disadvantages here? Where is closed loop? Unity gain stability. Ah, great. 
So number one is you need to be unity gain feedback stable. Right? Because if you're not unity gain feedback stable, sorry, can't do this. Right? Can't close that feedback like that. Because you're going to start oscillating, and obviously that's no good. By the way, directly related to this, what else is kind of not as good about this particular design? Sensitive to seeing. Sensitive to seeing. Ah, OK. Uh, you're right. You are actually sensitive to see in. And by see in, I'll be specific. You mean this. Why are you sensitive to see in? Because in phase 5 1, it's not dependent on see in, but in phase 5 2, it is. How does it depend on see in? Like when you connect it to VIN, it will be the voltage at the node will be like the ratio of the capacitor. Ah, there we go. Right? There's actually a capacitive divider. In other words, in your amplification phase, phase two here, in reality, this thing, it certainly starts at VOS, but when you connect it to VIN over here, it won't really be exactly VIN, right? Because there's always some small amount of cap right there. So what you'll actually get will be something like, and let's call it COS and CIN, right? What you'll actually get will be something like COS over COS plus C in times V in. That is all one thing plus VOS. Okay? In other words, because of that capacitive divider, you're losing some gain on the signal. Right? That's also true. That's also bad because, hey, you know, I built an amplifier, but I'm attenuating the signal before I even get into the amplifier. Right? So obviously, from a noise, et cetera, standpoint, that's not as good, right? So obviously there, you'd have to make sure that this offset cap is large enough that you don't lose a lot of your signal. By the way, what else is actually related to the fact that I do this that's not quite perfect? <coughs> Somebody maybe other than Shiva. When I said that this V out over here is equal to VOS. Moving high gain. Ah, there we go. Right? It's not really VOS. It's actually what? What is the actual output going to be if I'm sort of more precise? A over 1 plus A. There we go. It's going to be VOS times A over 1 plus A. So if I really want to precisely cancel the offset, that means I need high gain. Right? That's kind of, again, bad news, because we just said a second ago, we need to be unity gain feedback stable, right? So I need high gain, and I have to be stable in feedback if I really want to very precisely cancel this offset here, OK? There's actually one other thing which is not quite as pleasant, let's say, with this particular design. <laughs> okay, you're right. The switch has some resistance. Um, so you're right. The switch has to be low enough resistance to sort of settle this whole thing out. Um, that's actually also true over here. But there's actually something else that does have a lot to do with the switch that you might worry about in this design. Miller amplification of the switch? Uh, not, well, you could, uh, I guess I could translate what you said into what I'm thinking of, but not quite. Um, it's, that's not a bad idea, actually, though. What did we say happens with switches? Glitch. Yeah, they cause glitches, right? Where is this switch potentially going to cause a glitch now? At the input. At the input, right? Because it's connected <laughs> to the input of the amplifier. So if I get any little glitch right there, sorry, that gets amplified, right? So I don't have any gain from my amplifier actually attenuating whatever glitch I caused there, right? Because it just shows up right at the input. <coughs> yeah, so that's actually the third sort of piece of bad news is glitches at the input. OK? So as usual with circuits, no free lunch, right? If you want to do the output offset cancellation, you're a lot less tolerant. You're a lot less sensitive to glitches. But you have to eat up some of your range. If you want to do the input offset cancellation, you don't have to eat up any of your range. But you're sensitive <laughs> to glitches. You're sensitive to the input cap, because that causes a voltage divider on your input. And you have to be unity gain feedback stable. And you have to have sort of reasonably high gain if you really want to fully cancel the offset. 
Um, so now, of course, the natural question is, which one do people use more often? Depends on the application. But for things with basically high dynamic range requirements, despite this long list of things that I said was bad here, this tends to be more common. Just because if you really do have high gain and you have any reasonable offset, it's really, really tough to deal with just throwing away this huge amount of your signal swing. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Or? Okay. So just before we sort of move on a little bit from this, uh, there's one interesting thing to keep in mind here, which is I, just, I, sort of, I sort of showed all these things for assuming that I could really tie my amplifier into unity gain feedback, right? But if I really had something like, for example, the continuous time comparators we talked about, or we said we'd want to build that out of a cascade of a whole bunch of amplifiers, obviously I can't take like five amplifiers in series or cascaded and then tie them to unity gain feedback because unless I'm really, really careful, just not going to work, right? So what people actually came up with is kind of a way of, in some sense, combining both this input and output offset cancellation schemes to allow you to do it for a whole bunch of amplifiers in a long cascade. So the way this works is kind of sort of like I'm showing here. So for this first amplifier, this kind of looks like just like your standard input offset cancellation, right? Except that if you sort of pay attention, I've actually added this extra capacitor over here, right? So now I can almost say, well, I'm, all, I'm storing the offset not only on this input cap, but actually on that output cap. The reason I'm going to do things this way is because of the following. So basically in phase one, I'm going to tie all of these things up so that they're all in unity gain negative feedback, okay? So they're all sort of like storing whatever the offsets are supposed to be, okay? Then the way I'm going to basically start using this amplifier is starting from the left and moving to the right, I'm going to start turning each of these switches off, okay, with like a, some small delay between when I turn each one of those off. Why, why do I want to do that? What's sort of good about that? What happens, for example, when I turn this S1 off? What was the sort of bad thing we said was just going to happen? Glitch? Yeah, it's going to cause a glitch, right? It's going to so cause some glitch at the input of A1 over here. Well, guess what? That glitch is going to show up at that output, as, and I'll just call it, you know, I'll abuse notation here, but I'll just call that A1 times glitch, right? Well, if this switch is still on, then now what I'm going to be storing across this C2 right here is not just the offset, but actually A1 times glitch plus the offset, right? So if I leave this on slightly longer, I will actually store whatever the impact of that glitch was across this capacitor, right? Now when I turn S2 off, Again, I'll cause a glitch at the output, but I'll store that across the next output capacitor. And I just keep going down and down the chain until I get to the very end, right? So what's nice about this is that basically by doing that staggered turn off, I can actually really drastically reduce the effect of all those glitches. Because the only thing that should happen is at the very end, okay, I'll get a glitch right here, but I have all of the gain in front of it that's effectively attenuating the effect of that glitch on the very input signal, okay? Does this kind of make sense, sir? Now, obviously, you have to be sort of a little bit careful with really how you build this, because it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to do this cascading with the right timing and all that. But indeed, this is sort of a fairly common technique if you have long chains of amplifiers like this, okay? Okay. So, so far, we've been talking about sort of reusing a single amplifier to do the can out offset cancellation. It turns out sometimes it's actually sort of desirable to use a separate amplifier to build that offset cancellation. And in fact, we had talked about this a little bit back when we sort of talked about the context of you know, multi-stage amplifiers and stability. We sort of talked about narrow banding. So let's just sort of take a look at that, and we'll see a little bit later why this particular design will be sort of interesting. Okay. So again, what I'm going to try and do now is, rather than directly using the same amplifier, 
What I'm going to want to do is reuse some secondary amplifier, or so-called auxiliary amplifier, to just measure what the offset is and try and cancel it. Okay. So in particular, the way I can do that is something like the following. So let's say that's V in and that's V out. Okay, and let's just call this, let's say, A1 and A2. Okay? So as we had talked about a few weeks ago, the basic idea here is fairly simple. Right? Let's say that this A1 has some offset in it. Let me sort of draw that in. So let's say there's some VOS right there. Right? Well, if I've got some offset, then of course it'll show up at this output. This secondary amplifier will amplify that offset back, pass it through this low pass filter, and subtract it back from the input. Right? In other words, if I make this A2 high enough gain, then I should be able to force this output right here to be exactly the same <coughs> as the offset. Right? So I should be able to just completely cancel that offset out. Okay. Now, what's the sort of bad news about this particular design that I've drawn here? What's, or rather, what's a little bit annoying about doing things this way? Power consumption. Okay, there's some extra power. We'll come back to that a little bit later, but that's actually very true. What? Okay, you're right. You have to make sure the thing is stable, although... Usually when I do this, I'm just going to try and make sure this is really, really low frequency, because I'm really only trying to cancel the offset. What about the offset of the A2? Say that again? Offset of A2. Ah, that's a great question. So what about the offset of A2? So how big of a problem is that? By the way, what will, what will happen because of the fact that A2 has offset? What will the output converge to? So let's say, I don't know, there's 10 millivolts of offset in A2. What will V out go to? Ten millivolts. Yeah, it also goes to 10 millivolts, right? OK, so how good or bad is that? Is that a big problem? Is that not a big problem? How would you decide if it's a big problem? Depends on how much it is related to V out. Ah, there we go. So it all depends on how big it is related to V out, right? So to say that another way, <coughs> depends on how much gain you have, right? So as an example, if I had a high gain stage here, this probably doesn't matter too much, right? Because when I input refer it, it's kind of small, right? If I don't have that much gain, then you're right, actually, this offset could be kind of a problem. Okay, that's definitely true. I'll claim there's actually one more annoying thing about this. We lose the DC content. There we go. We've lost the DC content of the signal, right? Because remember, <laughs> any time you take something, you take some amplifier and you tie it a negative feedback through a low pass filter, you're creating a high pass filter from the standpoint of the signal, right? So if I look at V out over V in, of f and the magnitude, of course. If, let's say that this, let's say actually A2 had infinite gain, then what you'd get would be something like this, right? Let me just redraw that. So basically, down at DC, you'd get no input signal through, right? Because, of course, with this loop that I've drawn here, you can't tell the difference between the signal and the DC offset coming from the amplifier itself. Right? Because at DC, I mean, these two just sort of look the same. Right? They look identical to each other. So that's actually, like, well, so by the way, this is a little bit annoying, but if I really wanted the DC signal, then this is really, really annoying. Right? So an example in like your project right now, you couldn't do something like this because I never said you wouldn't have DC bit sequences coming in. Right? So by the way, how would you fix this? If you still wanted to get that DC through, what could you do? Move the DC somewhere else. OK, that's right. I can move the DC somewhere else. What trick did I play just like two or three slides ago to somehow get the signal to behave differently than the offset? What did I have to add into my circuit? Yeah, add in some switches, right? So if you still want DC, 
<clears throat> Basically, you add in some switches. Okay, so let's see how we might do something like that. And by the way, it's actually not too complicated. In fact, it's sort of quite obvious. So just like before, probably you're gonna have something where you either look at VN or look at ground. Or by the way, when I draw the ground here, it doesn't really have to be ground. It just means it's like a differential zero, right? You just need to make sure that the differential input into the amplifier is effectively zero, okay? So I could have something like, I either look at ground or the input signal. And then I'm going to redraw sort of that feedback amplifier slightly differently. So let's say in particular, I wanted to make sure I had infinite gain in that feedback, meaning A2. So now rather than building that as an off amp, I'm going to build it as an OTA with just some capacitive load on it. Okay. So now all I have to do to sort of finish this thing off is essentially that. Okay. So as you can kind of see here, during phase one, I put ground into the input of the amplifier, or differential ground. I close this feedback loop. So I turn on that OTA. I have this OTA basically start moving charge on and off that storage capacitor there. Then when I actually want to amplify the signal, I turn off this switch, I turn off this switch, and I just feed in the input, right? So that when those switches are off, I literally just have V in connected to my amplifier just plus some stored offset, right? So by the way, this looks a lot like the input offset cancellation. It's just that I haven't done any sort of, well, okay, I haven't shown you really how I built this plus and minus here. But I'm just basically, rather than putting the capacitor in series to do the addition, I've sort of just built it through this auxiliary feedback here, okay? As we'll see in one second, this is actually, this is kind of a nice way of doing it. Because there's a very, very simple way of actually building this plus and minus here. Okay? And in particular, imagine that somehow Vn was actually, I'll draw this with a slightly, imagine <coughs> Vn was actually being driven by another OTA. Okay? So if you want to do addition or subtraction, how do you do that with OTAs? How do you like add or subtract signals if you have OTAs? Parents. Yeah, OK. You, know, you basically add or subtract currents. How do you add and subtract currents? And in particular, how do you add currents? Short their outputs. KCS. Yeah, you just short the outputs together, right? So if I do, let's say that's a GM, and this is another GM. Let's say that's V1, and this is V2. If I want to add those outputs together, guess what? That's as trivial as just shorting the outputs together, right? You just literally tie those two wires together and the currents add. Okay, beautiful. Now, by the way, if you wanted to do subtraction, what do you actually do? Particularly with, let's say, these OTAs are differential. How would you build subtraction? Tie their outputs. Yeah, so you just tie the negative output of one OTA to the positive output of the other OTA. Right? So you'd add the negative current to the positive current, and indeed, that would act as subtraction. Okay, So in fact, if you sort of take a look at it, this is just an example of how you might implement something like this, where now I really don't have these sort of series caps messing up my gain. So essentially, this is my main, in this case, it's really meant to be an OTA, just the symbol wasn't drawn that way. This is like my main OTA. This is my auxiliary OTA for the feedback. And if you kind of take a look at the circuit, all that's really happening here is these two switches they're the ones that just couple the output back into this auxiliary input. Okay? This switch right here, this is the one that just makes sure the differential input into the amplifier is zero. Right? Because when I turn that switch on, I'm just forcing in plus to be the same as in minus. Okay? So basically in the first phase, this switch is on, so I have differential zero. These two switches are on, so I just feed back the outputs into the input of my auxiliary amp amplifier. So really during that phase, I'm canceling the offset of this amplifier. Then in the next phase, I turn off this switch, I turn off these two switches, I somehow couple my input back, and it makes it to the output. Okay? So again, just to be sort of really clear, you know, if you want to see how something like that is built, 
if I just looked inside of that OTA right there, and I'll just draw, of course, like the simplest implementation we can think of. So if this was my main OTA, okay, then again, if I want to basically just subtract or add the output of that auxiliary amplifier, then all I do is I just have another differential pair over here, okay, where I just take the auxiliary input. In this case, let's call this, uh, that's right, VA plus and VA minus. Okay, where VA plus and VA minus, that's just those auxiliary inputs. Okay? And notice, because of the way I tied it up here, I'm actually implementing a subtraction. Right? Because this is like the negative output gets tied over here, and this is like the positive output gets tied over there. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? So again, the basic idea here is that by using that auxiliary amplifier, now I can actually subtract off this offset without adding these caps basically in series with the input. And if you sort of pay attention on this slide right here, it even says, oh, for this auxiliary amplifier, maybe you only use like one-tenth of the GM as this main amplifier does. Okay? Now, again, of course, since it's circuits, there's always a trade-off. What did I pay to get around the sort of loss in voltage signal that I would have had from the capacitive coupling? In other words, when I do this particular implementation, what's the sort of quote unquote bad thing about this implementation? Power. I think I heard somebody say it. Just speak up. Power. Yeah, I have to pay more power, right? Because I've got this auxiliary amplifier thing that's not giving me any gain. It's just creating offset, right? Anything else that, by the way, will also translate into power that I'm paying to do this? Capacitance. Yeah, I've got some extra parasitic cap right here, right? So I've got those extra input pair, and it's just going to add extra parasitic cap onto the output. So if I want a certain speed, again, I'm going to have to spend more power to hit that same speed because I have extra parasitic cap. Okay? Okay, so keep this sort of thing in mind because we're going to see in one second that this is actually going to be sort of a useful way of doing things, even if we're not doing this sort of adding in a bunch of switches and things like this. <coughs> so keep this sort of auxiliary amplifier example in mind for a second. But just before we sort of dive into that, I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about sort of what happens when we do all of these auto-zeroing or correlated double sampling tricks and how they actually affect some of the noise characteristics of our amplifier. In particular, I want to talk about how does this actually impact our flicker noise, okay? Now, if you remember way back in the beginning, I kind of said, oh, a lot of times we can kind of ignore flicker noise, and if it really is a problem, there's sort of tricks we can use to get rid of it. Well, now is actually where I'm talking about how, what tricks we can use to really get rid of it, okay? So in order to sort of see that, what we can do is sort of look at this conceptual model of a lot of these techniques that I used a second ago to try and cancel the offset. Okay? And by the way, I should mention, why am I specifically focusing on flicker noise here? Well, flicker noise, remember, that has this 1 over f shape. So that means like most of the stuff is kind of concentrated at low frequencies, right? Well, what is an offset? What kind of noise is that? DC. DC yeah, it's DC noise, right? So that kind of says that if, if I have some technique that's basically killing DC noise, probably it's going to help me with low frequency noise too. So in particular, it's going to help me with getting rid of things like flicker noise. So let's just see sort of conceptually how something like that might work. So if you sort of think about what we've been doing, over here at the input, in the first phase when we're sort of trying to cancel the offset, we just ground the input. That's kind of like setting what's the reference point, right? So during the phase that this is on, we just sort of ground the input. We have some either offset or flicker noise going into the amplifier, right? In the second phase, when we actually start looking at the input, for almost all the things that we were doing, what we were essentially doing was taking the difference between what did the output used to be when I grounded the input, and what does it become when I connect V in, right? So this circuit right here, 
that's just kind of like taking that difference. So this S slash H, that's just meant to be like a sample and hold, meaning it just keeps track of the previous value from, in this particular case, one half cycle ago, okay? So this thing, it would store like basically this noise amplified by A, and then on this path, that's where the V in would actually show up. Right, and if we think about sort of the output, we're always looking at the difference between those two. Okay, and actually I guess I should do it more correctly. Usually we do that. Okay? So what I'm kind of getting at here is that if you sort of look at this thing right here, that's kind of where I claim that I'm taking the quote unquote derivative. Right? Because I'm storing what did the offset and actually the noise look like half a cycle ago. And then I'm going to take the difference between that and my new offset plus noise plus the actual signal, right? So why is it that it's sort of, and by the way, this isn't really exactly the derivative because I'm doing like, you know, v, you know, v at a certain time minus V of a delta T beforehand, right? So it's not exactly a derivative because if delta T is not zero, it's not truly the derivative. But it's kind of like an approximation, right? So again, why is it sort of useful to think of this thing as taking the derivative of the signal? What does that sort of tell us about what should be happening inside of the circuit from the standpoint of specifically things like 1 over f noise? It'll get rid of the DC component. So yeah, it's going to get rid of the DC component, right? If I take the derivative, if the thing isn't changing, it goes away, right? So let's actually sort of take a look at how we can come up with that somewhat slightly more mathematically, OK? So I claim that if you walk through that block diagram I showed there, which was a discrete time system, and I want to know what's the output of that thing at a particular discrete time. So t here is like the clock rate. Okay, That's like how often I toggle those switches. k is just going to be like some cycle number. So if I look at what's the output at some particular cycle, it's just going to be the gain of the amplifier times the input signal at that particular time plus whatever the 1 over f noise was at this particular sample, minus whatever the 1 over f noise was one half cycle ago. Okay? And I say it's one half cycle ago because I'm just assuming that I use these switches in a way that for one half of the cycle, I was looking at only the noise, and the other half of the cycle, I was looking at the signal. In other words, I'm just assuming that spacing there is t over 2. Okay. So this is what I claim is sort of like the output of my amplifier, OK? So what I want to do now is sort of translate this into the Laplace domain, just because I'm sure you guys are all more used to it than sort of Z transforms. And then we'll see sort of like what does that mean about the <coughs> magnitude of the signal, of the output signal, or really the output noise versus frequency. So the only thing you sort of have to remember to take the Laplace transform of something like this is that anything that has a delay in it which is all that's happening right here, right? I'm just taking the difference between the 1 over f noise at a certain sample minus the 1 over f noise t over 2 beforehand. <coughs> Delay just corresponds to e to the minus s td, OK? So if I wanted to like write this transfer function in terms of what's the transfer function I'm performing on the 1 over f noise, it's just going to be 1 minus e to the minus s t over 2, OK? That's like the transfer function of this uh, differentiation or really <coughs> this difference that I'm taking on the 1 over f noise. Okay. So now if I just want to sort of figure out what's the magnitude of that versus frequency, I can do my sort of standard tricks. I can change e to the minus st over 2. That of course just becomes e to the minus j omega t over 2. e to the minus j omega I can replace with cos of something plus j sine of something. right? I can do some pile of math, none of which is particularly interesting. <coughs> it's all written here, but nothing's sort of really magic going on. At the end, if I want to look at the magnitude squared of this thing, you end up with something like this. Okay, you end up with four sine squared of omega t over four. Okay? Which by the way is actually if you look at, you know, this is the magnitude squared. If you look at just the magnitude, it's two sine omega t over four. Okay? Now, this usually, you know, when people look at this the first time, they're like, well, hmm, this is a little bit weird. There's a couple of things that are a little bit weird here. So first of all, 
I have this weird sign inside of here. So I'm kind of saying something like, and you'll see this actually on the next slide, but I'm saying something like, hmm, if I plot the magnitude of that response, and let's just, you know, we'll sketch it here. I'm saying something like, if I just look at that sign component, it's going to do something like this, right? So it's sort of like oscillating between two values. And of course, it does indeed actually hit 0. Hmm, so that's a little bit weird. So anybody, anybody have any idea why is it that it's doing something like that? Any thoughts? By the way, I should be sort of a little bit more precise. This is actually the magnitude of the sign, so it really looks like that. Okay? Let's see if we can sort of decode what's happening here. We said that when we take the difference between, you know, a signal at time x and a signal at delta t before that, we kind of said that looks like a derivative, right? So what does a derivative look like versus sort of frequency? What's the shape of that in terms of magnitude, of course? Increasing with frequency? Yeah, it's like s, right? So if I just had the derivative, it would look something like that, right? OK, so now, why is it that, of course, so we said down at low frequency, it kind of looks like the derivative is kind of matching, but then at some point, this thing starts bending over and doing other weird stuff. So why is it that it's doing other weird stuff? In particular, like what's happening right there? Why is it going back to 0 at that particular frequency? If we sample a sine at the sine's frequency, then we'll just see the same value each time. Right. So basically what this point right here is, is it's just saying that if I just so happen, happen to <coughs> sample an input signal that just so happen to have the same exact phase at this delta at this t over 2, right? then it would look like it was constant, right? So I would subtract the same value from each other twice. And obviously, I get 0 <coughs> output. So to say it another way, this is like, since I'm doing all these things as sampled systems, this is just like the, the point at which I've aliased it back to DC, <coughs> right? So this thing repeats like this because each of these is just, these are like all the Nyquist bands, right? Where I've aliased the input signal back to DC. Now, there's one other thing that's kind of interesting here. Notice there's this factor of 2 in the front, which, by the way, is going to happen to correspond to the peak of the sinusoid right there. So I have 2 times this sine. So if I look at the magnitude, this peak point right here, that's at 2. What the heck's going on there? Why do I have 2? Because, by the way, this 2 seems to imply that I'm actually amplifying the noise, which should sound a little bit weird but does indeed happen. So why is that happening? Why am I actually increasing the magnitude of the noise? Somebody other than Dan. Because uh, it's aliased, it's like constructive interference at that point. Ah, great. It's like I'm constructively interfering, right? So if I just so happen to have, and maybe I'll sketch this here, if I just so happen to have an input signal that was doing this, right? And let's say that when I sampled it the first time, let's say that that's kt minus t over 2. And when I sampled it the second time, I happened to land right here. Let's say that that's kt. Right? Let's say that's plus 1. This is minus 1. If I take the difference between those two samples, guess what? I'm going to get 2. Right? Because... Just like you said, it's effectively constructive interference. Right? I'm taking A minus minus A. Okay? So in fact, at particular frequencies, I will indeed actually be magnifying the noise. Simply because at that particular frequency, I'm going to add constructively. Okay? So if you sort of understand all of this, then this plot right here should sort of make perfect sense, OK? So this red piece, that's exactly just the transfer function, OK? That's just 
the filter that I'm applying to my 1 over f noise. This blue thing right here, that's just what I get once I pass my 1 over f noise, which of course looks like that versus frequency. That's just what I get once I pass it through this red transfer function, which is just, again, taking the derivative or really taking that, that time difference of the 1 over f noise. Okay? So what you can see is there's actually sort of, again, two interesting things that have happened here. So the first is, if you look at that blue curve, of course, down at DC, I have no 1 over f noise left. Right? Because I just basically have subtracted it out by doing that difference operation. So at low frequency, this really just looks sort of like a derivative. Right? There's kind of like an S just going up over here. But once you get close to the sample rate, or really that T over 2, now actually you sort of start amplifying, and then you start aliasing it back. Okay. So what sort of happened here is if I look at that blue thing, if I would have had something that, let's say, did that, and you know, my drawing's not great, but let's say something like this, now all that junk that was down at really, really low frequency, I've completely gotten rid of it, right? So that's really nice because now, you know, since now I don't have to like arbitrarily tell you anymore, oh, you should integrate from a kilohertz, you should integrate from 10 kilohertz or whatever it is because now actually all that stuff that's down at low frequency, you're basically just killing it, okay? So that's, again, how this sort of auto-zeroing or correlated double sampling, that's how it really helps you to eliminate things like flicker noise, okay? Now, again, you do have to be a little bit careful, though, because for flicker noise, because we know it's concentrated down at low frequency, this is good news, right? Because I'm getting rid of all of that stuff at low frequency. But as we said a second ago, at high frequencies, you know, if you pay attention to this, I'm actually amplifying things up. So even though this is good for flicker noise, is this actually sort of good for thermal noise or no? How is passing thermal noise through something like this, you know, what impact is that going to have? Is that going to help me, hurt me, maybe not do much? What do you guys think? I guess it looks like it's amplifying noise at your frequency of interest. Um, yeah, well, okay, so we have to be a little bit careful because, you know, again, I'm actually folding things over, right? But so you're kind of right. I'm actually amplifying things up at this particular, you know, right here, which is right near my Nyquist <coughs> frequency, right? So you're right, actually, I'm actually amplifying things up right when it gets close to the limit of my quote-unquote bandwidth, right? So in fact, what I'm really doing, and in fact, not only that, I'm actually amplifying all these things out at multiples of my Nyquist frequency that I certainly don't care about, right? So what this basically says is if you do something like this, you better be careful to really filter the thermal noise out, right? Because otherwise, you're going to pick up all this extra junk from higher frequencies, and you're, in fact, even going to magnify it somewhat, okay? So on the net, I mean, by the way, you know, since I've killed some of it at low frequency and amplified some of it at high frequency, it may not necessarily result in significantly worse noise performance. But it's definitely something to keep in mind because, as you said, now the noise is no longer white. It may actually be larger specifically at the spots that I care about it. Okay? There's one other sort of important thing to kind of keep in mind here. Let's say that I had a process that had really, really high 1 over f noise. So let's say my 1 over f corner was, I don't know, 100 megahertz or something like that. What would that imply about how fast I need to run this circuit here to really make sure that I'm doing a good job of getting rid of that 1 over f noise? What do you guys think? 10 times as fast. Yeah, something like that, right? I probably want to run it at least a factor of 10 or a factor of 5, somewhere in that ballpark faster, right? Because by the way, what is running it faster? How does that change the shape of this red curve? So let's say that this particular thing, I don't know, I'll just make something up. Let's say that this one, let's say that that's, I don't know, 200 megahertz. So that would correspond with me running the thing at 200 megahertz. Okay, so if I ran it at 400 megahertz, how would the shape of this curve change? What would it look like? Thinner and taller. Actually, I think it's probably the other way, 
So what is the height fixed by? <laughs> yeah, so the, the height is, is fixed at 4, right? Because that's always the worst thing I can do, which is 1 minus minus 1, right? So the height is fixed, and it's actually going to get wider in frequency, right? So that peak is going to move to right there, and the next null is going to be sitting right there, right? And then, of course, it'll repeat. <coughs> So that's kind of what I was saying about, you know, if I have this really high one of ref corner, that's why I need to run the thing faster. Because if I have a really large one of ref corner, I want to make sure that I'm sitting in this region where I'm really taking the derivative of the noise for a longer period of time in frequency, or a longer, I should say, longer range of frequency, excuse me. Right? So what this is kind of telling you is, you know, A, of course, you need to run the thing fast enough to make sure you can actually get the signals you're interested in. But if you have a lot of flicker noise, you better run it even fast enough that you can actually get rid of all of the stuff at low frequency that might cause you a problem. Okay? Does this sort of make sense to everybody here? Okay, so now if you get this, then actually the next idea, which is again still in the same broad category of just treating the offset differently than the noise, should make a lot of sense. Okay, so this next idea is called chopping. It's a very similar idea in the sense that you're still sort of you're still sort of moving things around in frequency, you're filtering. It's just that now we're not really going to take the derivative, but we're actually going to sort of modulate the offset up to a much, much higher frequency. So let's just sort of take a look at the block diagram of this, and it should be clear sort of what the big idea really is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my input signal, and I'm actually going to multiply it by some, as an example, square wave. Okay, where that square wave has some certain frequency associated with it. Okay? So that multiplier there, that's conceptually that's like a mixer. Okay, but if I do it with square waves, you can actually implement that just out of switches. So I take my input signal, I pass it through that mixer. I'm gonna keep in mind that of course I have some offset from my amplifier. I'm gonna pass it through my amplifier. Then at the output, I'm gonna take the output of the amplifier. And then again, multiply it by that same square wave. Then take that output, pass it through a low-pass filter, and then that's going to be my final output. Okay, so let me call that VO. Let me actually call this VOF. Okay, let me just call this right here VMID. Okay? So, just first of all, in case you haven't sort of seen something like this before, <laughs> By adding these two mixers like this and multiplying them both by the same waveform, from the standpoint of the signal, if I look from here to here, from the standpoint of the signal, the idea is that I shouldn't kind of be doing anything. right? Because imagine that this is just like minus 1 and plus 1. Okay? And same thing over here, minus 1 and plus 1. So if you sort of think about it, if I take the signal, I multiply by minus 1 and plus 1. I'm, I gain that up, and then again multiply it by minus 1 and plus 1 with the same exact phase. Then I should, at the end of the day, just get back my signal, right? Because if I take the signal times minus 1 times minus 1, that's just the signal. Signal times 1 times 1 is also just the signal, right? So in other words, this whole block right here, is kind of like trying to do nothing to the signal. But as we'll see in one second, because the offset appears over here and does not get multiplied by this first mixer here, it's actually going to get filtered out by this low-pass filter. Okay? So let's see how that might happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw sort of like the frequency spectrum of the different signals inside of this thing as we kind of walk through the chain. Okay? So let's say I have just some input signal. And for this particular example, let's assume that it's band limited, meaning it only has frequency content up to a certain point. Okay? So that's like the spectrum of my input signal. So now, if I look at the spectrum at that middle voltage, which again is just right here, what's that going to look like? How is that going to be changed by me mixing it up like this? By multiplying it by that plus 1, minus 1. 
Sorry, say that again? Oh, okay. So there are actually some, not exactly impulses, there are some spikes. Let's just, let's just make life even simpler. Let's pretend this was a sinusoid at a certain frequency. Okay? Let's call that frequency F chop. So what would that do to the signal? Shift up to it. Yeah, it would shift it up, right? So if I used to have something that was centered around DC, now I'd have something that would be centered at F chop, right? Okay, is that the only thing that shows up at that middle voltage, or did I pick something else up? The offset? Yeah, I picked or up the offset. And by the way, let's say the offset includes my 1 over F noise and my, my thermal noise and everything, right? So that's going to look something like, let's say, this. Okay? Well, so now what I'm going to do, I go through my amplifier, and then I'm going to go through another mixer like this. So now let's look at what happens at that VO. What's the spectrum going to look like there? v is going to get mixed back down to DC. Yeah, so my signal is going to get mixed down back to DC, right? What's going to happen to like my 1 over F noise and my thermal noise and all that other stuff? <coughs> mixed up to v chop. Yeah, it's going to get shifted up to F chop, right? So now that's going to look something like that. And sorry for the bad picture, but something like this, right? And that's going to be centered at F chop, OK? I obviously didn't draw it exactly at F chop because technically it go, you know, or at least with my equations, it would go off to infinity. Don't worry, it doesn't really do that. But it just, you know, there's some junk centered around there, OK? <coughs> well, now. Once I go through the low-pass filter, at least if I had an ideal low-pass filter, what should my output spectrum now look like? What do I have left? The original signal plus some residual blob stuff. Yeah, so all I should have is basically the residual signal plus th some thermal noise, right? plus some noise, let's say, that goes out to whatever the bandwidth of my filter is, right? So notice by doing that, all of the 1 over f, all of the offset, all of that stuff, since it shows up at this chopping frequency, when I pass it through that low-pass filter, it's going to kill it, right? Because when it shows up over here, it looks like, because I've gone through this chopper, it looks like it's actually a sinusoidal signal, even though it was really the DC signal with the input of my amplifier. Right? Does this kind of make sense to everybody? Or? Now, so why do I spend some time talking about this, by the way? Sometimes it's actually fairly natural to do this kinds of things. Because as an example, if you have, let's say, like a capacitive interface where you need to be sort of chopping things, you need to modulate things just to even pick it up in the first place, it's very natural to use this kind of chopping architecture. But again, maybe just so that it's clear, kind of already based just on these sort of pictures here, what has to be the case for me to sort of effectively use this? What has to be the case about, for example, this chopping frequency relative to my signal bandwidth? Where do those two have to be compared to each other? F chop has to be larger. Yeah, F chop would be at a much, much higher frequency than my input signal is, right? What else does this mean about my amplifier, by the way? How do I have to design the amplifier here? Really high bandwidth. Well, either high bandwidth, or I have to make sure that this amplifier works all the way up at F chop, right? Because <clears throat> I better make sure that this F chop is far enough away from the signal I'm actually interested in, so that all of this junk over here doesn't still get picked up in my actual signal band that I care about, OK? Now, maybe just to sort of briefly mention it before we close for today, so we can move on cleanly for next time. Uh, turns out, you know, again, any time you do these kinds of tricks, uh, life is always sort of more interesting than you first think it is. So this circuit that's drawn right here, um, it's a, it looks a little bit complicated. All it's really doing is basically, it's called a butterfly switch. All it's doing is either taking the input signal directly on this path or swapping V in plus and V in minus. Okay, so in other words, it's really just multiplying by plus one or minus one. Well, if you remember I had mentioned before
there's always errors whenever you turn those switches on and off, or in particular when you turn them off. Well, if you have some error that happens when you turn the switch off, again, that can somehow make it back out to the output. Because right? it's kind of like that glitch is also going to get modulated and it'll look a lot like your signal. So if you just do like a single <coughs> chopping, a lot of times your residual sort of offset or your residual noise is fixed by the amount of glitching you have inside of there. As you can imagine, the faster you want to run those switches, the larger those glitches may turn out to be. Okay? So what people who are sort of really, really paranoid about these things, so if you want to like, as an example, if you do something like this, you can probably get your residual offsets down to like the microvolt range or so. If you want to make it like down in the nanovolt range, what you can actually do is basically add another set of chopping switches around your already chopped amplifier. And the reason this sort of works is the following. So you basically take these high frequency choppers inside of here. That's kind of like doing most of the work. That's like pushing most of this offset out to a really, really high frequency. Okay? But because these generate glitches, what I want to do is somehow add an additional chopping stage to take those glitches and move those glitches also away from my signal band. Okay? So the way I do that is I add these extra choppers on the outside, and if by running them at lower frequency, the idea is that I, the, the glitches I would generate from these should be much smaller than the glitches I generate from these high frequency choppers. Okay? So this is a so-called nested chopper amplifier. Again, I mention it only because if you really want really, really, really low offsets, like you know, down in the nanovolt range or so, this is again something that you might actually be interested in. So, any more sort of questions on this kind of stuff? Or okay, so we'll pick back up and finish this up next time. So, I'll see you guys then.